Today we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Sumner Sambo. The World Bank predicts that the global economy will experience a subdued recovery this year from the devastating pandemic. However, it warns that the near-term outlook is highly uncertain and growth could be imperiled if coronavirus infections and delays in the rollout of vaccines continue. The World Bank forecasts 4% growth in 2021, following a 4.3% decline in 2020. Coming back in 2021. At the global level, we are expecting growth to be around 4%. If you look at advanced economies, they are going to deliver growth around 3.3%. And if you look at emerging developing economies, we are expecting growth to be around actually 5%. Uh, so there are some good news. Not so good news is that it is still a subdued recovery. Uh, it is going to take time to recover from this uh, devastating year of 2020. If things go well and we have widespread vaccine deployment in advanced economies, major emerging market developing economies, uh, by the end of 2021, uh, I think that these uh, growth forecasts are going to be reasonably fair. There are some uh, few uh, very highly effective uh, vaccines, uh, they are going to change the trajectory. Uh, now uh, it is up to policymakers to make sure that there is widespread deployment of vaccines to a large share of population around the world. For 90% uh, of countries, per capita incomes declined last year. For a quarter of emerging developing economies, per capita income losses basically erased all the gains of past decade. So as much as growth is coming back, there are still significant challenges in many uh, parts of the world. I'm joined now via Cisco Webex by Greg Swenson, a partner at Brig McAdam, an Africa-focused investment bank. Good to have you, Greg. And I, I, I would like to get your point Great on uh, what the World Bank is actually saying generally about the two biggest economies in Africa, to talking about uh, Nigeria and South Africa. Um, the World Bank is saying that in South Africa, growth is expected to rebound to 3.3% 3 in 2021, while uh, growth in Nigeria is expected to resume at 1.1% 1 .1 in 2021. What do you make of all these figures? Yeah, it's not a surprise because the uh, the economy in, in Nigeria is still so dependent on oil exports and the, the oil prices are not helping. And and you saw that in the, even in the foreign direct investment, as much as foreign direct, direct investment was down um, considerably last year, down anywhere from 25 to 40 percent in sub-Saharan Africa overall, you know, it was already down 10 percent in 2019 because of commodity prices. So I think the countries that are more dependent on, on oil exports, as well as those dependent on, on um, tourism, were particularly hard hit. But at least with tourism, if it comes back in the second half of the year, and then those that are exporting either agriculture or services, you know, can, can have a, a better recovery in, in, the, in the first half of the year. But for, for oil exporters, it's a little bit, um, you know, until the global economy really recovers and, and demand for oil increases, I think that, that Nigeria will continue to have headwinds. And that's why South Africa might have a, a, a quicker rebound because they're a bit more service oriented. Uh, the Nigerian government has uh, called this a technical uh, recession that it's uh, undergoing, saying that um, it hopes to exit this uh, in the first quarter of 2021. But a lot of uh, persons are actually not very comfortable with the efforts being put in place by the government to get the country out of its second recession. What are your thoughts on the, uh, 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 on, on the things being put on ground, the actions being taken by government? Do you think, uh, for example, the budget figures that have been rolled out and efforts to ensure that those budget figures are met are on the right track? Yeah, good question, Sonner. I, I think 
Look, there's there's some long term issues here that that aren't going to be able to you know turn around right away in terms of you know labor market flexibility, you know strengthening transparency and governance. Those are things that have been going on for years, and I think it's going to take a little bit more time. The you know the immediate headwind, as I mentioned, are commodity prices, and that's that's going to make it very difficult for the Nigerian economy in particular to recover quickly. But I would hope that they'll keep. Um, they'll continue with the reforms. They'll continue, continue, you know, strengthening the business environment so that in the long term there's less dependence on oil, and we can develop other other parts of the economy. I see a lot of portfolio investors actually coming into Nigeria to put their money into the economy, considering that uh, 2020 was hit most by COVID. We also had this border closure that was stopping lots of businesses going on, and uh, it devastated a lot of foreign investors. Do you foresee them returning to the country anytime soon? I, I do, I do. And I think in Nigeria, there's there's a bit more of a liquid market. And again, there's there's always opportunity in, in oil and gas. But um, so I think that, that there are some exceptional returns in the liquid markets. And I think that because Nigeria is still the biggest economy in sub-Saharan Africa and still the, the biggest population and a, and a you know top 10 oil exporter, um, or t at least in terms of oil reserves, I think it's still going to be a destination for capital, especially liquid capital. But in the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, and to a certain degree in Nigeria, the real opportunity is in private capital, um, in, the, in the private equity markets, as well as a great opportunity for foreign direct investment from, from uh, Western DFIs. So if you can sacrifice liquidity, um, if you can, in a sense, short liquidity and have more patient capital, the opportunities are exceptional. And we're, you, know, you, you, can, you can't get these private capital type returns in Western economies. But I, so I think, you know, while there's challenges and there are problems, those are really opportunities, not just to make impact as, as you have, you know, a, a significant increase in impact investing and, and uh, focus on Africa for that, you know, for that reason in particular, but also it's, it's opportunity, it's impact and, and opportunity for private investors. You are, you are a respected economist, and uh, a lot of persons, you know, seeing these um, uh, projections by the World Bank will seem to be dampened by some of the projections for Nigeria, because the World Bank is saying here that uh, though there's an anticipated growth of 1.1 percent, but these anticipated growth will be dampened by low oil prices. You've seen the OPEC quotas being given to Nigeria, and uh, a lot of persons are afraid also that the government is not working to get other revenues from other sectors other than oil, which it's depending on. In all of this, would you ask the citizens to be optimistic or uh, pessimistic about government revenues in 2021? Samir, it's a great point. It's, it's a, as I said, it's a real near-term challenge, and I think... The, co the countries and the economies around the world that are going to recover quickly are the ones that are best positioned to do so or that had you know the proper balance um, you know in terms of regulation regulation and tax reform and structures you know as I said earlier transparency uh, labor force flexibility governance those are the ones that are going to be in a position to recover first. For example, you know, the US, while it contracted 3.6%, it's expected to, to grow 3.5%. You know, down 3.6 isn't that bad, considering the European market was down 7.4, Japan was down 5.3, and the UK, where I'm um, where I'm seated right now, was down, you know, almost 10%. So, you know, the economic destruction was worse in countries that had perhaps overburdened uh, regulatory restraints and tax burdens, whereas the, the countries that are well, were well positioned before the pandemic um, didn't do as poorly, but also are positioned to recover. So I think the Nigerian um, po population has to just be patient because right now, you know, there's still that dependence on, on oil exports for, uh, for government revenues. And I think it's, it's going to be a challenge, but I would just argue that Patience is a virtue right now. now. Patient capital is coming in. I mentioned the Western DFIs, um, sp especially in the U.S. and the U.K., 
are investing and taking long-term views and being very patient with their capital. And by the way, at the same time, they're getting exceptional, you know, risk-adjusted returns. So uh, it, it's a it's a bit of a challenge. It's going to take some more time to diversify away from dependence on oil. It's one of the risks of, of having a major, you know, commodity to export. But I think you're seeing it in other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. If you can develop proper business structures and and bring sort of what I would argue are Western values in terms of how to run business with transparency and governance, it, it will work. It just might take some more time. Let's have your view on the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Do you think uh, Nigeria will benefit so much from this in uh, the next one to two years, being the largest economy on the continent? Yes, absolutely. And, and look, that uh, the agreement was obviously a, a great step uh, toward in integration on the continent and, and free trade. And I think there will be great benefits from it. Unfortunately, because of the uh, the pandemic, you know, I think the the immediate returns from that, um, you know, weren't really available in 2020. But I think you know the the combination of increased foreign direct investment. Uh, from the West, as well as the, the, you know, more trade in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa between the countries, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. And so, you know, the, you know, the, the, the higher value being assigned to, to ties to the continent from other economies will be beneficial, as I said, the, the direct investment and the patient capital coming from the West, and that combined with the, with the trade agreement, I think will yield exceptional you know, value uh, for Nigeria and for the other countries in the region. Enthusiastic uh, domestic investors actually putting down their money investing in the Nigerian economy, despite uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign investors shying away from the economy. What do you make of that? Yeah, and as I said, this didn't just start with the pandemic. Granted, it made it a lot worse, but you know, the FDI was down in 2019, roughly 10 percent. But again, with you know the, the diversification of of, uh, of investments for you know both in, well both investment and supply chain diversification coming out of the COVID crisis is making at Sub-Saharan Africa a, a much more important destination for Western companies in Western countries. So yes, the returns, the risk adjusted returns are exceptional. I think the risks are, are overrated sometimes. Um, there's limited competition for capital with the Chinese backing away, with the CCP having to back away from Africa. And, and in some cases being, there's pushback against Chinese capital. Um, you've got a great opportunity for Western investors because of the limited competition and also for, for domestic investors as well. And so, you know, look, that, that combined with the, you know, the demographic story, which you hear all the time, you know, it's really compelling. And I think it would be, uh, it's really difficult for, for Western investors to ignore Sub-Saharan Africa and specifically Nigeria, g given that it's the biggest economy. So, you know, there's a lot of optimism and the optimist amount, as you know, the, the optimism on the ground is infectious. Uh, there's some near-term hurdles, there's some near-term headwinds, but I think from a long-term perspective, this will be a very good year for, for the increase in FDI. As we, okay, I've, I've been told that we do not have enough time right now. We just have to go on a short break. Just hold your thoughts there, Greg, and when we come back, we'll continue. You're still watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead, including we'll take a look at the outlook of African economies in 2021. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Sumner Sambu. The biggest issue going into 2021 for African economies, without a doubt, will be sovereign debt. Despite the slowdown caused by the coronavirus pandemic, almost all African economies are expected to return to decent growth rates this year. Analysts say they see opportunities for African economies despite the COVID-19 pandemic shocks. Well, I still have with me via Cisco Webex, Greg Swenson, a partner at Brig McAdam and Africa Focus Investment Bank. Good to have you again, Greg. Now, let's talk about some of the projected growth for uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, what do you foresee in 2021 amidst this uh, pandemic? Well, look, I'm a little more optimistic than the World Bank, um, who I think has it up 2.7%, and, and that would be great, but I think the, the continent can do better. And I've noticed that most of the projections for 2021 
we're typically um, we're typically off to the downside, you know, especially in, in the U.S. economy, but also in, in the in emerging markets. Um, a lot of times, you know, they had to readjust upwards. So, so I'm a bit more optimistic because there there is a you know, as I said earlier, there's a great you know a lot of opportunities. And and remember that even though the the, the GDP contraction was only three and a half percent roughly, or down to anywhere from two and a half to three and a half, depending on the metric. Um, it was expected to be up 7%. So that's not just, you know, a two and a half or 3% contraction. It's actually a, a disappointment to, to the tune of, you know, seven, eight, nine percent So there's a lot of room to rebound. And typically the, 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 the more contraction there was, like you saw in Europe, um, the greater the rebound, you know, the, the, the Euro economy is expected to, to rebound, you know, three and a half percent. So I think there's opportunity to, outperform that World Bank figure. And I think that you'll see, as I said, a lot of capital coming in. Um, there's also a lot of opportunity with in agriculture. So, you know, you, even though oil prices are down, food prices are not. So you, you have a great opportunity for the food exporters um, in Malawi and Mozambique. And so um, there, there's opportunities, you know, outside of, of just the, um, the energy commodities. When you look at the figures for Nigeria and the projections, uh, what specific sectors do you hope to see encouraging economic growth uh, between the first and second quarters, especially? Yeah, that's it's it's going to be a challenge, Sumner. I think you know until the oil prices you know see some sort of additional recovery. I know there's been some stabilization, but I think that um, th there's opportunities in consumer products and telecom, um, as there always are. And I think what's important is to get the vaccine out and, and enable travel again, because the, you know, the, the, some of the service industries, especially travel, the airlines obviously, have been absolutely crushed by the lockdowns. So was, uh, I think what's really important is, is getting the vaccine out. Well, fortunately, Sub-Saharan Africa has an advantage over the rest of the world in that the population is significantly younger. So you know, once the, the, the economic contraction isn't necessarily as bad in terms of demographics. So as long as we can get, um, you know, vaccines into sub-Saharan Africa to relieve the, you know, the, the senior population but, and enable the rest of the population to get back to work, traveling and, and, uh, and working and producing, you know, that's the sooner the better. So I think there's still great opportunity. Um, the, the oil prices are a headwind. I know that's making it difficult for the government, but, uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the economic growth is right around the corner. And uh, I will want to get your view on uh, the kind of market that Britain will be seeking, uh, considering that, uh, you know, the Brexit issue has been concluded. And uh, it looks like Africa seems to be a fertile ground for business <laughs> for the UK. So what kind of partnership do you think the UK will be seeking? What kind of trade deals do you foresee being concluded and closed here in Africa by Britain? Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, as I think I mentioned earlier in the segment, one of the, the challenges or, or one of the issues that was really exposed at the beginning of the of the pandemic was the depend dependency on supply chains in China, not just around the world, but especially in the U.S. And I think that a lot of Western economies want to make sure that they can diversify their supply chain and, and be less dependent on China. So you'll see a lot of economic activity and growth in Southeast Asia, ex-China, uh, or Asia, ex-China, as well as in Africa. And, and because the, the UK has always had a considerable amount of uh, foreign direct investment and trade with Africa, that should continue. And, and like, you know, the, the returns on FDI, the foreign investment rate of return, is higher globally in Africa, you know, or higher in Africa than anywhere in the world. The last 20 years, the GDP growth is two times what it was in the 80s and 90s, and, and you know we've always we've discussed the, the demographic advantages from uh, you know in in the region. So there's there are a lot of reasons to not only invest in Africa but also trade with Africa. And you mentioned Brexit and, and the UK. Look, this has liberated the the UK to pursue trade deals independently. You'll see a lot more activity from the UK. Uh, and and by the way, last week you saw a. a, a not a trade deal, but a, an agreement or a, a, a memorandum of understanding between the EU and China, which I think is a bit unsettling for the U.S. and, and, and Americans. But 
Um, but I think that also creates a great opportunity for Africa um, in, in terms of trade. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the, the lack of competition or less competition from Chinese capital, you'll see both credit credit spreads, or, you know, returns for credit investors in, in the form of higher yields, as well as exceptional um, return on equity for, you know, metrics for, for private capital or private equity investors. So it's a really great opportunity right now. And you should, you, you'll see a lot of, of uh, new trade deals from the UK. And uh, as a respected economist, what would you advise uh, countries like Nigeria and other sub-Saharan African countries to do with uh, 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 the UK? UK is a former colonial power to Nigeria, and there's a lot of influence that comes with that. How would you uh, advise the Nigerian authorities to actually uh, cut deals with the UK at this point in time? I, th I, I don't know how specifically to, you know, to advise, you know, uh, I mean, except for reaching out directly to the to the UK trade people that, that are uh, very active in Africa. And, and you know, I, even even with the lockdown, there's, you know, constantly, um, you know, Zoom calls and presentations from UK trade, et cetera. So look, they're, they're, I'd say, you know, continue to, to be active with the UK government to, to begin, or at least um, as a conduit to the private sector. And, and as soon as travel is able, you know, to, to pick up again, I think there'll be a lot of improvement there. So, you know, my thought is continue with increasing transparency and go governance that comes, you know, with capital, but also with good advice and also take a page out of the Western, you know, playbook or the U.S. playbook of, you know, uh, while you're adding governance and transparency, but also trying to reduce overregulation as well as as uh, aggressive tax burdens. And I think the special economic zones are are a great example of a way that you can encourage investment and encourage trade. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity, Summer. The issue of insecurity remains here with us as a country, and uh, I mean, it's a normal phenomenon across uh, uh, sub-Saharan African countries. How do you expect uh, countries like Nigeria to ensure that that does not blot the kind of economic outlook that uh, the World Bank has projected ahead of the year? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and, and I know it's a big issue. And I think that um, there's there's two ways. One is, you know, obviously uh, maintaining security is important uh, from the, the militaries in Nigeria as well as other sub-Saharan African countries, but also at the same time making sure there's economic development and direct uh, economic investment so that there's alternatives to you know, to, to joining a militia, for example. And we're seeing that in Cabo Delgado, in Mozambique. We've, of course, have seen it in, in Nigeria for years now. And I and it's important to make sure that there's alternatives, that the education and the job growth is in place so there is an actual, um, you know, there's an attractive job market for young people. And I so, that, so it's really, you know, both maintaining the security but also providing a, a positive alternative. Jobs, jobs, jobs are what uh, Africa's population are majorly looking out for. In all of these economic indices rolled out by the World Bank, what the average citizen would want to hear is how soon they can actually get a job. So how soon do you think African yeah. governments like Nigeria and uh, South Africa can provide jobs for their people in the midst of all these challenges rolled out? Yeah, it's it's. I know it's a big challenge, and and I and I hope it it's remedied quickly. I think what's important to keep in mind is it really isn't up to the government of South Africa or Nigeria to provide the jobs. The best thing they can do is provide the the the, the atmosphere or the business climate so that capital can be invested to create jobs, and that's the the best thing. And by liberal liberalizing the the labor markets and making capital investment more attractive, you know, whether it's through tax policy or, as I mentioned, in um, free economic zones, you know, anything that can, that can inspire investors, um, you know, to, to invest and, and to do business. So it's both trade and investment. It's, it's going to be less what government does. And in often cases, it's, it's what government doesn't do besides making the business environment attractive.
Try to round off this conversation very quickly. We've seen a huge fluctuation of our currency, the Naira, uh, in 2020. What do you foresee for the Naira in 2021? Uh, just very quickly, an advice to the central bank <laughs> on currency management. Yeah, I should point out I'm not an economist, I, although I'm flattered by your, your comment, uh, and, and not a currency expert. That's always been a big challenge for Nigeria, and we've been able to remedy that from from the perspective of, of Western investment, because most of the, the transactions or most most of the business, both in trade as well as investment, is done in dollar based assets, right? So if we're trading oil, um, it doesn't we don't really have to worry about the currency risk, except for possibly you know expenses you know in the country, but but generally speaking, most of the exports whether it's agriculture from, from other countries or oil in Nigeria and Angola, it's all in dollars. So there's the currency risk isn't that meaningful. There are concerns about the credit markets, uh, you know, and, and paying I'm back afraid. U.S. dollar-based <laughs> debt. I'm afraid we just have to go at this point in time. Greg Swenson, um, uh, financial analyst there and economist, it's been really nice having you on this uh, time on the Arise News interview. Ar Ar Arise interview, I mean, it's been really great having you on the show. Thanks so much. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview. I'm Somna Sambo. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching.